Welcome to the Radical Lifestyle Podcast, brought to you by Generation to Generation, where you will be inspired by the past, equipped for the present, and prepared for the future, as we engage in conversations with people from around the world. Hello everyone, this is Andrew and Daphne from Generation to Generation, and our guest today is Colonel Richard Kemp. Richard, for people that don't know who you are, can you just say a bit about where you're from and what you do? Yeah, well, thanks very much for having me on your show, both of you. Um, I'm, uh, a Br- I was a British Army officer. I was, um, uh, I was at school, left school one day, joined the Army the next. Um, and I stayed in the Army for 30 years. Uh, during my time in the Army, I served in Northern Ireland many times, Iraq, Afghanistan, the Balkans, and a few other places. Um, after I left the army, I spent some time involved in um, corporate security. And now, I, essentially, I'm a writer. I, I write in national press, and um, I've written a book about Afghanistan. And I, um, I do a certain amount of media commentary. And I also do quite a lot of time uh, speak public speaking. Um, I'm uh, very involved, although it's not my full-time job i'm very involved in um issues relating to israel particularly the idf or i'm not jewish and i'm not israeli so it's a slightly unusual uh, combination being being a christian who's uh, very closely involved with the israel defense force hmm. and for people listening to us that want to find out more about you uh, maybe see some of the things that you're putting out there where can they do that uh, i think everything i write um is on my website, which is uh, richard-kemp.com. So it's not too difficult to uh, to get to. Okay, and I'll actually put that in the description. So for people listening, they can go straight there and check that out. Um, Richard, we I'd like to you know you're you're decorated, uh, have been hugely successful in, in what you've done. Uh, can we just go back though, um, maybe back to your upbringing? What was that like? And what led you to end up joining the forces? I was uh, from a family of four children. I was second, two brothers and sister. Um, my father was a master mariner. Um, mm. My mother was uh, worked for the NHS. And uh, we, we lived, uh, I suppose you could describe it as a comparatively normal life. I went to... Um, to a state school um, in Colchester, Colchester Royal Grammar School. I was probably the worst pupil they ever had <laughs> academically and probably in terms of behaviour. <laughs> um, I, I was I was mod- moderately okay at sport, but that was about it, really. Um, nearly got chucked out a few times. Surprised I didn't. My father was even more surprised I didn't. I used to love playing soldiers when I was a child, and... Um, I never really grew up, so it was a natural progression to to leave school and join the army, which is exactly what I did. I literally left left school one day, joined the army the next, and um, never really looked back. It was and it was never something I thought about, never something I considered doing. It was just something that I was always going to do from my really earliest recollection. My father was, um, as I mentioned, he was a master mariner. He wasn't in the army as a professional soldier, although both he and his father were um were did did service in the arm army during the first and second world war respectively Uh, so i don't really come from a professional military family um it's sort of just something that somehow managed to get into me i mean it's that's your story of getting in but what's what's even more um interesting to me is that you stayed in whereas Many uh, come in and then they leave and they do a few years. But you stayed in, I think you said, 30 years. What kept you there? I, I, I enjoyed the work. I really liked it. Um, I, I, I managed to, the, 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 more, the higher up you get in the army, the easier it is to influence your destiny within the army. Mm-hmm. So I managed to orchestrate things um, as best I could to ensure I spent the maximum amount of time deployed on operations rather than sitting behind a desk, because that's what I wanted to do. I like commanding soldiers. 
I spent most of my time, I think, commanding soldiers. And I, I did a, a large number of operational tours in the different places I've already mentioned. And that was what I liked. I didn't much like being in barracks. I didn't, certainly didn't like pushing a pen or tapping a keyboard. Um, there was a, there was the something, um, I think there's something uh, enormously satisfying about commanding soldiers, um, not just in order to ensure they um, win in, in combat and in operations uh, and, and that they are kept alive, but also to ensure that they have the best possible life they can have in the army. Mm -hmm. um, they achieve as much as they can for themselves, personally and individually. And I think you can, you can do that much more effectively and comprehensively in the army than probably any other walk of life. No. And I think, um, I, I, I believe, I read somewhere not long ago, actually, that the, um, the real purpose of a leader, and it's not just a military leader, but the real purpose of a leader is to make things better. And that includes making things better in the circumstances that you're responsible for influencing. It includes making things better for the individuals that you're supposed to be leading. And I think that, that quite nicely sums up um, I think the satisfaction that, that you get when that I got from my time in the army. So we did an episode with the Israeli Navy SEAL commander and he was talking about that very thing, yeah. uh, that while he was serving, he noticed there were things which were not helpful to the soldiers. And in fact, some people that he was over ended up getting killed uh, because of some of those scenarios and that he managed to go on to be in a position where he could go back, uh, not into that situation, but make those things different so that it wouldn't get other people killed uh, and make life better for the people that he was over. Mm. Um, looking back at your time in the in the military, would you say there was a, a period where, you know, that that period of my service was my favorite part that, that really stood out to you? Not that we all, we like wars or anything like that, but, but for you, was was the most impacting period of time? Well, to be honest, um, anyone who joins the army as a combat soldier, which I was, I was in the infantry, so a foot soldier, anyone who joins the army in that capacity does it because they want to fight. So when you say you don't like wars, well, of course you don't like wars, but you do want to fight. That's why you join. You wouldn't join if you wanted to collect stamps or do needlework or something like <laughs> that. You, jo you join to fight. And it sounds, it, to, to, to somebody who hasn't been involved in it, it sounds uh, quite a sort of bizarre and um, perhaps even grotesque thing to say. Mm. But it's a bit like, um, I mean, you know, why do you do it? You do it because you, you know that the country that you uh, owe so much to the country needs people to help protect it. So it's a kind of a moral perspective and position rather than just taking from the country, you can give something to it. Um, and and it's, it's a bit like in that, in that kind of respect, it's, you know, wanting to fight is a bit like a surgeon wanting to chop someone's leg off. Mm. Now he doesn't want to chop, he, he doesn't actually want to chop their leg off, but he, he, he knows it's got to come off. And he enjoys doing it. If he doesn't enjoy doing it, he's not going to be a surgeon. He wants to he doesn't be the want one. To, yeah. yeah. He doesn't want, he doesn't want to be a, he doesn't want to have traffic accidents, but when they occur, he wants to be the one that deals with, goes in with his knife in the same way as we don't want a war, but when there is one, we will go in with our bayonet. Mm. Um, and I think if you, if you, um, if you ask me about the most rewarding and, and satisfying period in my military career I, I i could name many many to you uh, and i had quite a varied time as well um but i would say probably the, the 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 best period of time i had was directly commanding troops and i did that uh, you know as a platoon commander on a couple of occasions which is a group of between 30 and 70 soldiers um i did it as a company commander leading 100 plus soldiers uh, and as a battalion commander leading around six seven hundred soldiers maybe a bit more um, and those all those periods were, were 
extremely satisfying and rewarding mm. and and enjoyable because it was such a pleasure to be in the company of infantry soldiers and that's one thing about the army i think that you're you know if you, i come I, sp- I suppose i would describe myself as being <clears throat> lower middle class perhaps something of that sort of my origins um maybe even working class from as a child but but you know you 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 meet people and you deal with people on a day-to-day basis in work out of work from a complete cross section of society every type of society you're dealing with peers of the realm who are in the army you know young young men who have inherited their their title people who've been to eat and people who've been to the most dif- difficult grammar school most difficult comprehensive schools in the country from every background and that's a real pleasure i think of of working with soldiers and, and fellow officers, um, so all of the, all of those periods to me was um, was were, were outstanding, and <clears throat> I think probably the, the the one I would say would would be the most rewarding and satisfying was when I was commander of British forces in Afghanistan, and the reason I say that is because um, I was at the top of the tree in Afghanistan at the time in the British Army British forces. And therefore, I could really have a major influence, far more than at any other stage in my career, a major influence on what <clears throat> what we were doing and how we did it. And it, it wasn't a huge organisation compared to later years when the British forces in Afghanistan became pretty significant in size. It was actually relatively small. Some, I forget the number exactly, maybe 1, 1,500, something of that sort, but not very many. Mm. Um, but my boss was in, uh, in a base north of London. So I was thousands of miles away from him. And that meant, and often the communications weren't as good as they should be. So it gave me a lot of independence, a lot of autonomy, which is something I, I relished. Um, and also Afghanistan was, was uh, I, I would say, um, one of the best things about it for me was that it was a new, co- a new situation. All the other places I'd served had been running in, in one way or another for many years, whether it was Bosnia, Northern Ireland, whatever. Uh, this was a new situation. The rules had to be made up by me as I went along. And that was, a, I think that was a good thing. Um, and, and the final thing I'd say, kind of associating with the Navy SEAL you mentioned just now, being able to take action that saved people's lives or made them more effective. There's one thing I just want to mention to you, which is a, when I went out to Afghanistan, this was in 2003, it was the first time, the, the tour in Afghanistan was the first time that British forces had faced the threat of suicide bomb attack. And I didn't know what to do about it because I'd never, I, I dealt with many different types of terrorism before, but never the threat of suicide bomb attack. Mm. And it was different and it was new and I didn't really understand it properly. So I happened to be working at the time, just before I went to Afghanistan, in the cabinet office in London, dealing with international terrorism. Um, And in that capacity, I worked quite closely with um, the head of Mossad station in London, the Israeli intelligence service. Uh, I dealt with them on a regular and frequent basis. So I said to this guy, um, can you get the defense attache from the British, from the Israeli embassy where he worked? To, to come and talk to you about how the IDF, the Israel Defence Force, deals with suicide terrorism. And he said, no. I like, what? I've given you many secrets I shouldn't have given you. I've brought you cups of tea, and you're not even going to give me uh, the access to the defence. He said, no, I'm going to do better than that. And he sent to the Golan Heights uh, and brought back to London two days later, just for me, the commander of a division in the Golan Heights, who was deemed to be the IDF's number one expert in suicide bomb attacks. He and I sat in a hotel lobby in West London. He spoke for about four hours. I wrote for about four hours. And at the end of it, I produced, from what he told me largely, the the policy for dealing with suicide bomb attacks in Afghanistan, which became the British Army's policy for dealing with suicide bomb attacks and is now NATO policy for dealing with them and remained extant. And that because of the, the actions of, of those individuals from Israel helping a friend, i.e. Britain, many, many British soldiers' lives, I'm sure, and other uh, allied forces' lives have been saved. 
That is wow. that is some story from the Golan Heights to the nations. Um, and you've just mentioned Israel. I want to quote something you said. Your website, by the way, is amazing. It's so easy to go through and see what's happening. Um, you said the challenges that Israel faces are very familiar to me. Can you talk to us about what is it that you've gone through that you can identify so closely with Israel? I think one thing I'd say before I answer that question is that the challenges that Israel faces as a nation yeah. are not familiar to me. Right. Um, they, I mean, they are now, but they're not the same challenges as Britain faces because no. anything Israel does is immediately, almost whatever it is, is immediately condemned yeah. by the media in Britain and other Western countries by university academics, by human rights groups, by some politicians. It is roundly condemned. Even if Israel does something outstandingly good, then um, many of these people will find reasons why it's bad, and they will find the downside. For example, the, the, the stupendous success with the vaccination program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 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 the Israel haters, of which there are many in, in our country and other countries, mm -hmm. Um, the Israel haters had to then accuse Israel of, of discriminating against the Palestinian uh, Authority uh, and Hamas in Gaza because they didn't vaccinate them as well. Well, that's a, a long story to describe, but it's simply not true. It simply is not true that there was any form of discrimination by Israel over that. But it's yeah. just an example of the fact that no matter what Israel does, it's condemned. When Israel sends IDF soldiers, as it frequently does, to assist with disaster relief, most recently, we've seen that in uh, in Miami when that uh, yeah, building yeah. collapsed. Mm. It, it, you, you know, the media very often will mention, um, the media outside Israel very often will mention that humanitarian aid has been taken in, disaster relief teams have gone in from different countries, never mention Israel. They can talk about how Britain sent it, America sent it, France, maybe they'll never mention Israel unless they're forced to in some way. So mm. it's that sort of, Israeli hate that that they face constantly and daily and affects their military operations that we don't have to face. But in answer to your question, um, when I say that a lot of what the IDF faces is, is familiar, uh, because we're fighting, the, we've been fighting the same war for a long time. We 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 are fighting a war against terrorists. Um, the main enemy at the moment is jihadist terrorists. Um, and, and they use the same tactics in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, in Libya, in Syria, in other countries around the world, as they do in Judea and Samaria and in Gaza and in Israel. They, 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 they use suicide bomb attacks. They use human shields. They, um, they do all they can to exploit misery, and they use them. They do so. Uh, and to create misery and exploit it. And they do so in the same way as the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and others. And, and predominantly, I think that that involves, you know, most, I think the thing that stands out most about their kind of conflict, jihadist conflict, is human shields. Um, and actually, it's not limited to jihadists either. That was the same tactics as, as predominated in, to, to a slightly lesser extent, in Northern Ireland by the IRA and other terrorist groups out there, they they because they know they cannot possibly effectively defeat a for a, a national armed forces or even get the better of a national armed forces without uh, you know on on a one to one basis they have to use human shields so they do use human shields um, and and it's those sort of tactics and it's things like you know in Helmand province in other parts of Afghanistan. Um, it, it, it's a common occurrence, or was a common occurrence, when British, American, and Canadian and other forces were deployed down there, for for, for the Taliban to use, you know, maybe a fourteen-year-old boy to throw a grenade down on top of a patrol, patrolling through an alleyway, knowing that the British soldiers, once if they saw this person with a grenade in his hand, they would not shoot, or they would hesitate to shoot for long enough to give the uh, the, the attacker an advantage. Um, mm. Because, of course, no soldier in any army, whether it's the British Army, the IDF, or the American Army, 
wants to kill a child unless he absolutely has to. So there's always that pause. And that's one of the things they will exploit. And, you know, using using in Afghanistan and elsewhere, the same as in uh, Gaza, using mosques, using hospitals, using schools, using ambulances as means of attacking our forces. All of these things and many others I could talk about are really what, what I, I certainly see as um, very familiar forms of attack and forms of conflict. And, and I would say, finally, I would say that um, the, the, uh, if you talk to, to the average either serving British soldier or retired British soldier about Israel, most of them have the utmost admiration for the idea. Mm. They don't, then these are not people like the majority, like not necessarily the majority, but by, like a lot of other people who will watch what the BBC says and believe it. They don't believe it because they know it's not true. And the reason they know that is because they use the same tactics against the enemy using the same tactics against them as the IDF. And they recognise that the IDF do it extremely effectively and admire that in them. Of course, one of the things they have been criticised for, the IDF, um, and, and this is on the flip side, and I can't remember where, but I do remember it, that um, they have such a high standard moral code of conduct. Um, when they join the IDF, they have this booklet that tells them exactly how they have to behave, why they have to behave that way, and it sets them above other armies. I mean, no no other forces that I know of drop leaflets over saying, oh, we're about to attack, you can get out, and things like that. And yet they're even criticised for that. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's, um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say that that in itself specifically, you know, the, the booklets, the code of, code mm-hmm. of, co- of conduct sets them aside specifically, because I think you could say the same about the British Army right. and the American Army. They all have very similar codes of conduct right. and codes of morality that they adhere to. Um, but you're, you're right about, about how they're criticised, whatever they do. They're criticised for warning. They're criticised not warning. I think, um, you know, there was, I, I, saw, I saw some criticism levelled against the IDF that when they were fighting in Gaza, what, one thing that proved, this is made by Arabs against them, one thing that proved that they were, that they hated Muslims was because IDF soldiers didn't rape the Muslim women when they, when they uh, went into an area, which is obviously what they might expect uh, other armies to do and and would in fact do so that was you know another criticism of them. extraordinary um but but i think uh i mean i i believe i do believe that the idf has a very very high moral standard and i i i um i was with a group of retired generals um former chiefs of staff of, of armies from around the world visiting israel and we, we did an investigation into the Gaza conflict in 2014, about 15 retired generals, um, including one from Britain, uh, America, France, Germany, Italy, Australia, India, South American countries. Um, and the, at the end of their visit, I don't think any of them or few of them had been to Israel before, didn't have any direct connections to the Israel of the IDF, no experience of that, of the IDF. But at the end of their um, mission and in the report, they, the, the one thing that they said was one of their, was probably their greatest concern about that conflict was the fact that the IDF had set a higher standard for protecting the lives of civilians on the battlefield than any of their armies would be able to behave, to, to, to achieve rather, um, which was quite an extraordinary thing to say and it, you know, it includes it included things like, as you mentioned, leaflet drops and phone calls, text messages, radio messages, various other forms of warning to get people out. Even dropping a harmless explosive on top of a building to give a final warning to people to go, and and not just that, but the quality of their intelligence relating to the areas they were operating in. So knowing a lot about who was where, much more than we would ever know, um, because of the the nature of the conflict there. Uh, and the, the length of time the Israelis have been operating there. And that was, you know, so if you think about it, that's that's diametrically the opposite of what Israel is so often accused of. They're accused, it's not as if they're, you know, they're accused of 
um, of war crimes and deliberately killing innocent civilians. It's not as if you can say, yes, well, they, of course, they're a bit careless. And so, they, no, it's, the, it's totally the opposite. It's 100%, you know, 360 degrees. Or if you think in mills, 3,200 mills, um, the, the direct opposite of what is there, what they're accused of. And, and I think I've got my own theory about the reason why this is the case with Israel. And, and, and it comes down, I think, to... Um, to two main things. One is that they are the IDF are mostly conscripts. There are some obviously the more senior people who are uh, there on a professional basis, but vast majority are conscripts. I spoke in I was in Tel Aviv um, a, few, a few weeks ago. I spoke in, 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 at an event where there were thirty thousand school leavers who just left school. Um, who are about to join the IDF, 30,000 out of, I think it's about 70,000 that join each year. All of them, they're just told you're joining and, and there you go. And that's it, they have no choice. So they're not like me and, and maybe many people in the British Army who, who actually want to fight. These young men and women who join the IDF, they want to be, they want to do stuff with computers, they want to be plumbers, they want to be drivers, they want to be builders, they want to be running the stock market or they want to, you know, they want to be journalists. A thousand and one other professions like everybody else, doctors, lawyers, all the rest of it, podcast makers. Um, and they, they uh, but they have to do their army service. And actually, they, they mostly embrace it with a great deal of enthusiasm, the ones I've met anyway, mostly. Um, so, so they're not, they don't have quite the same kind of gung-ho approach as maybe professional soldiers do who want to be there doing it. So I think that makes them a little bit more maybe a little bit more um, careful about what they do. And I'm not saying that the British Army is not careful because it is extremely careful as well. I think a slight difference. And the second reason, I think, why um, they have this quite extraordinary level of morality, which is often maligned, is the, the religion of Judaism. And I know that most, um, uh, most uh, Israelis are not practicing Jews. Most of them are, are uh, many of them are, but they're not all, well, most of them aren't. Um, but nevertheless, I would say Judaism permeates Israeli society, including the armed forces, in a way that Christianity no longer permeates British society. It used to once, it doesn't today. Um, and of course, Judaism and Christianity share many, many values. And those values, of course, um, strengthen people's morality and, in a way, internally compel them to behave in a more moral way than if you don't have that religious uh, influence over you. And so I think in, in Israel, for many it does. For most, I think, in some ways it, it influences them. In the UK, not the case any longer, only in the case of a few. Mm. I get a lot of people that message me um, during conflicts and they say uh, they might send me clips that they've seen in, on social media or maybe clips from the news and they'll say, hey, look, I know you go to Israel a lot. Um, is this true? Is this really what happened? And I'm constantly having to go back to people and say, you know, that's not really the case. Um, uh, I mean, a tip from me, uh, you know, if you're hearing reports about what's going on in the conflict, as it's happening, um, you may want to wait for 24 hours, wait a couple of days, there'll be some more news coming out, which may be slightly different from what mainstream media is telling you in the moment. But are there tips that, that you could give to people who are listening that uh, I know you've been involved with intelligence and stuff like that, and there's a lot of unintelligent uh, responses <laughs> to, <laughs> to what's going on in Israel, especially around conflicts. Um, are there tips that you could give the average person who's out there going, oh, there's this massive distrust of mainstream media. Um, I don't know who I can believe when it comes to this information. Um, are, are there tips that you could give people on how to navigate that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it is extremely difficult. I and mean, I would say about your what you said about, well, wait for a bit and see if more news comes up. I would say there's not much chance that more positive news will come up because even if, even if people believe something in the moment, 
uh, let's say, you know, as in the last conflict, um, the IDF uh, carried out a strike against a tower building containing media officers, which was immediately seized on as being effectively a war crime and a desire to suppress the media, which it wasn't. Um, but that, that you'll never see that refuted. I mean, refuted, yes, but you'll never see the media revise it. Because right. bad news is great and it sells papers and it, it gets people to watch TV stations. If you change that to actually, well, actually, the IDF did have a very good reason for doing what they did. And it was legal within the laws of armed conflict. And they did ensure that everyone was out of the building before they hit it. And it was necessary to save lives to hit that building, which is all, all the case. I've investigated that one personally in the last few weeks, and I can assure you that's the case. Um, and uh, but but that will never that will never come out. They will never they, the media will never go, go reverse that sort of thing. And it's partly because, as I say, good news does not sell papers or get people to watch TV. Bad news does, and and also they have an agenda. People at the BBC have a very distinct anti-Israeli agenda. And, you know, just for example, there is a, there's a, a report compiled by somebody called Balin quite a few years ago now, an investigation into the BBC's anti-Israel bias. And the BBC, since that report was published, I think we're talking about back in 2007 or something of that sort, a long time ago, since that report was published, the BBC has spent hundreds of thousands of pounds of British taxpayers' money to ensure it cannot be made public. They've, they've challenged it in court. They've 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 suppressed it, and it can't. That can't be because it because the report says, oh, the BBC is far too even-handed over over Israeli reporting. So we, we can, I think, work out what the reason is, and so that's their that's their agenda. And and I would say to to people trying to negotiate the the truth and the the the, the lies in relation to Israel and the Israeli conflicts is disbelieve what the mainstream media say. Just don't believe it. It might be that some of it is true. It might be, but the likelihood is it won't be true. And it'll be, it might be based on fact, but it'll be heavily biased against Israel. So I would, I would, I would watch it. I'd certainly watch it because we need to know what is being said in the media. And I do watch all that. Um, but I also take it with a very, very big pinch of salt because I know it's probably not right. Um, there are various uh, various sources to go to, uh, including your own work and the own material you've put out, which I would also commend to people. Um, there are groups like Stand With Us, who I've worked a great deal with, mm. who, who publish information and they, they have some good social media sites. Um, there are, there are uh, you know, uh, there's a, in, in Britain, there's a, a group called the Pinska Centre, which I would again endorse uh, they're, they, they're, they're aimed mainly, they're kind of looking at Stand With Us. There's also Stand With Us in Britain, but they're, they're, they're dealing with a sort of similar kind of approach to Stand With Us, the Pinsker Centre, aimed mainly at universities, etc. cetera. Um, there's Christians United for Israel, which, again, they publish some useful material. There's BICOM. I mean, I could, I could run through um, many... Uh, organizations that produce material that is worth keeping an eye on mm. um but you know if you again if you uh, i quite often highlight um these sort of reports and information on my twitter feed which is at col richard kemp um and and that might be worth i mean i'm not i'm not i'm not begging people to follow me on twitter or anything like that but that might be worth looking at occasionally because i do tend to to highlight um, these these uh, you know useful information and to, and to and to give criticism when it's not useful, yeah. but I think the one thing I would say it's you know, it's it's comparatively easy once you get into one of these sites to to kind of follow it through. Things like UN Watch is another very good one who published a report very recently showing um, and numerous cases of Jew hate uh, and support for Hitler among teachers teaching in UN schools in Gaza. And as a result of that, the UN's just, I think, a few days ago, maybe even today, I can't remember when it was, maybe yesterday, today, announced that they were doing an investigation into 40 teachers. That's just the tip of the iceberg. But UN Watch is another example of, of 
a good organization to follow. Um, the what, what what I would say is though is is you've got, you you've got to, and if you're interested in the truth, and if you're interested in countering lies as opposed to just not believing them, but countering them, then you've got to spend a lot of time looking at this because it's such a complicated situation. Yeah, um, and it's so. Uh, it's so easy to miss something that is then crucial information. Um, but I think particularly if you are, I mean, I take my hat off to, to Jewish students and, and also mem, you know, non-Jewish students who are members of pro-Israel and Jewish organizations in university who are constantly fighting this battle. I take my hat off to somebody who's trying to study for a degree and at the same time keeping on top of this situation because it's not easy and it is time consuming. Um, but I think I think you know you've got to do that if you possibly can if you have any interest in truth and countering uh, the lies about Israel. Mm. When you left the forces, um, what prompted you to to continue to stand for Israel in a very vocal? Uh, you've been in front of the UN. Uh, did you think you know what? Uh, I, I still got energy for a fight and. Um, if I go in this direction, there's definitely going to be one. Uh, is that what motivated you? What, what, what prompted you to continue to, to be very vocal in your support for Israel? It wasn't quite that. I think I could have found a several more lucrative fights had I chosen <laughs> to. There are always good opportunities around the world for people who are trained soldiers to uh, earn a great deal of money continuing the fight. Um, no, that wasn't, that wasn't really the... Uh, the reason, although I, you know, as I meant, I wouldn't shy away from a fight if I saw one around the corner, um, <clears throat> as long as I wasn't too heavily outnumbered. Well, even if I was, probably. But um, <laughs> the, the, I think uh, actually, you do raise a, a very good point, though, because I think a lot of um, a lot of people ask me, why is it? Why are you, and not you know, you say that other soldiers and ex-soldiers feel the same as you about Israel, why, why do you not? Why do they not stand up and say the same thing? And I think there's mm. a couple of reasons for that, one of which is really what is in it for them, that most people don't have that much interest in Israel, um, to be honest. So it's not kind of a natural cause to, to go to. Secondly, it's, it's a very unpopular cause. And if you, as you, as you sort of said, if you, if you stand up and... Um, uh, and, and publicly support Israel in what it's doing and publicly condemn the, 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 the false allegations made against Israel, then you're going to get trouble. You're certainly going to get trouble. I get a lot of trouble all the time. And I actually welcome that because, you know, I get a lot of anti-Semitic hate, even though I'm not Jewish. Um, I welcome it because, because I know that the sort of people that are capable of dishing out anti-Semitic hate uh, are the sort of people that I want to annoy. And I am annoying them, which is why they, they get back at me. I've, I, I've, I'm on an Al-Qaeda death list. The police told me if, uh, a few years ago that my name had been found on a, an Al-Qaeda death list in, um, in Syria, I think it was, or maybe Iraq. I've forgotten now. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that because... Was, was there a price? Uh, I can't remember. If you want to claim it, then um, <laughs> I, can, I, can probably, I can probably find a way of uh, getting you the money other than killing me. I wonder, but, um, I wonder what the price was. <laughs> no, I don't think it was. The, I don't think it was price. Um, <clears throat> anyway, that that, um, that 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 those sort of things are another reason why people don't speak up. And they've, you know, they've had they've had that many people who are in, who've been in the army <clears throat> have done a bit of fighting, and and they don't want to carry on. They, why would you? you know? uh, and and the other thing, I think many of them um, do. Uh, have lucrative contracts with Middle East uh, security firms or governments in the Middle East, and they, they, they're worried that, um, that that might be jeopardized if they publicly stand up for Israel. Quite understandable, it's their livelihood. Uh, although probably not so true now, because Middle East, many Middle Eastern countries are, um, are, uh, are clearly a, have been for a long time and are now particularly strongly changing their views on Israel. Um, but uh, yeah. sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a very long-winded oh, no. your, your question. But I think the 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 answer to the question is that um, I when I when I left the army, 
um, the first, I was well aware of the anti-Israel bias and, and it affected my work in the cabinet office dealing with international terrorism. As I mentioned, I dealt with mm -hmm. Israel. So I was well aware of it and it affected the work I was doing. Um, and there was, you know, part of that bias is in the foreign office. Our British foreign office is, has quite a strong strain of bias against Israel, which again, I had to contend with in order to uh, work alongside Israel in, in tr trying to counter uh, threats from international terrorism. Um, but, but of course, while a serving officer or soldier, you can't speak out on political issues. So it wasn't something I could say anything about publicly then. Um, but after I left, I could. And um, uh, the first war that occurred after uh, with, involving Israel after I left the army was the first Gaza conflict, which is called Operation Cast, led back in 2008 9. Um, and by that stage, I'd already built up a, a media platform in relation to commentary on, on Afghanistan and Iraq and other military matters. So I was asked by the BBC, not on the basis of their, their, any knowledge they had of my views in Israel, because they didn't have any, but on the basis of my what they considered military expertise. So they asked me to comment on why I thought the IDF were, were callously killing, deliberately or carelessly killing innocent civilians in Gaza. And the comment I made was that uh, they weren't, that they were, you know, that the, 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 um, the IDF took greater efforts than any army in the history of warfare to prevent the deaths of innocent civilians on the battlefield. And, and really, from then on, um, the fight came to me, as it were. I got a lot of abuse for saying that. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a lot of, um, uh, I, I even got, you know, contradicted. As, as a so-called military expert, it's not usual for a BBC interviewer to, co to contradict you, what you're saying if they ask for your views. Um, but they did in this case. Uh, and and it, it kind of went from there. But the reasoning behind it was because, um, one, I, had, I knew from my experience in the cabinet office, I knew the benefits that the relationship with Israel has for Britain. Many, many British lives have been saved by Israeli intelligence, Israeli battlefield medical technology, Israeli military technology, countering bombs, um, uh, drone technology, etc., uh, and, and, and numerous other services that the Israelis provide for us. And we it's reciprocal, of course, it works both ways, but I, I was well aware of the benefits we got from it. Um, and, and I also knew that we are fighting the same fight. And that if the IDF, I, and I knew very well that the anti-Israel propaganda was all about undermining the Jewish state in its fight. It was not about just smearing for the sake of smearing. It's about making it much more difficult for them to defend themselves and to isolate them in the world. So I, um, and I knew that, you know, we're fighting the same fight. We're on the same side. We're fighting the same enemy in many cases. We use the same tactics. So I, I felt I had an obligation anyway to, to, to stand up for them as I would have stood up for Britain or America had it been um, had it been maligned in the same sort of way. Uh, and I think, you know, just to f finish off this question by um, quote a, a chap called Jose Maria, uh, Jose Maria Aznar, who was the uh, former president of Spain who founded an organization called Friends of Israel Initiative, which is still running. And incidentally, that group is another one to watch if you're uh, looking for the truth on Israel, Friends of Israel Initiative. Um, and, and he said, he wrote an article in which he said, if Israel goes down, we all go down. Mm -hmm. And I believe that as well. So I think what small amount I'm contributing to the fight to stop Israel going down, and, I, and by the way, I don't believe for a moment Israel is going to go down, but what small amount I'm contributing to that fight is also to, to, to stop us from going down. Yeah. Um, Anti-Semitism is rising and rising fast. Um, I think many people either close their eyes to it or it just passes them by. Um, and I've seen that you have spoken to students and you've speak and, spoken to young people, um, th which is a huge focus for us. Um, there's a quote we say, to turn a nation, you've got to take the next generation. So with anti-Semitism, 
what do you see happening with students um, in the colleges, in the universities, etc., as far as Israel is concerned? I think it's uh, it's a devastating situation, and um, we we saw during during um, the last Gaza conflict that occurred in May. Um, we saw a dramatic rise in anti-Semitism in the UK. And the same pattern applied in other countries of the world, including Europe, uh, sorry, including Europe and the US. Um, <clears throat> and and that, that is prompted by, um, I, I would say, to a very large extent, not exclusively, but to a very large extent, it is prompted by um, university academics, human rights groups, who seize on these sort of situations, even though they know these are not stupid people and they know the truth, they know the reality, even though they know that what they're saying is lies about Israel, they seize on the conflict, the misery of people in in Gaza as well as in Israel um, in order to, 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 to spread their due hate. And things like the uh, Palestinian Solidarity Campaign and other groups that are, that are trying to um, impose boycott, divestment and sanctions, um, they, 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 they know that they, they know they can't defeat Israel. They can't. They, the BDS movement, for example, uh, boycott, divestment and sanctions has made no impact, no impact at all in the decades it's been running on the state of Israel or the Israeli economy. No impact. They know that. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to make life difficult for Jews in this country. And why are they doing that? To get them out? Because, of course, you know, anti-Israel, uh, those people who are anti-Israel are anti-Semitic. The same thing. It's the same one and the same thing. And so they don't like Jews and they want them out. They want them to run for, for their lives from this country, which many of them have done. Too many, tragically. Um, and they also want to make Jews condemn Israel. And, and, and again, they've succeeded to some extent in that, in making Jews distancing themselves from Israel, not being Zionists, not standing up for the, the Jewish state. Um, and, and it works. It does work, unfortunately. Thankfully, not not completely but it does work and 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 that's what they're trying to achieve by it um and, and so i think it, it's and it's not just when the conflict occurs it's a constant constant theme whenever i go to a university to uh, speak on the subject of israel which i do quite frequently i always get protests made against me always not that they know what i'm going to say well they may maybe they've got a good idea of it but Anyone really, any any speaker going to speak other than condemning Israel is protested against. And it's an underlying theme and it's very hard. And I think the, the people who it's hardest for in universities obviously are Jewish students. And I think everybody um, in, uh, you know, any, anyone with any decency at universities has a duty really to stick up for the Jewish students there. Um, whether they, whether these people are, know anything about Israel or don't, but the, the, you know, these are our Jews in our country being discriminated against in the 21st century. We should have seen the last of that in 1945, but we haven't. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, and I think the situation is getting worse. It gets worse year on year and it needs to be stood up to and condemned. And the worst thing that can happen, in my opinion, is for Jewish people to turn on Israel, to disown Israel, which many have done, many too many, because it, you know, it, it gives superb propaganda to Israel's enemies. Even Jews have turned against this country, and it's shocking and disgusting. And I think our government has a responsibility here as well. For, for example, during the last conflict in May, the, um, the, the, the British government, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, made a statement early on in the conflict. He said he calls on both sides to exercise restraint and you know, come to a, a agreement on stopping the conflict as soon as possible. That is bias, that's anti-Israel bias, calling on both sides to exercise restraint. Why is that anti-Israel bias? Because he's, he's equating a, 
a, a prescribed terrorist group, Hamas, with a democratic, liberal democratic country trying, trying to defend itself against this, this terrorism. So he, did, he had no right to say that. What he should have done was to absolutely condemn Hamas outright and stood up and supported the state of Israel. Yeah. Did, yeah, I think did he, did, has he has he condemned the Afghan government for standing up against the ta that Taliban? Has he asked for both sides? No, he supported the Afghan government, condemned the Taliban, and I think he had a duty to do that. And the yeah. only leader I think that I know of in Europe that exercised that duty properly was Sebastian Kurz in Austria, who flew the Israeli flag above the uh, the Chancellery in Vienna uh, in solidarity for Israel during that conflict. Wow. Yeah, and I think at the time when Boris made that statement, I think at that around then, uh, about 10,000 rockets had been fired at, it, fired at Israel, and I think Israel had fired like 10 back. And then he was like, whoa, 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 restraint on both sides. It's like, wow, 10 rockets in response to like 10,000. Uh, that sounds like some pretty good restraint right there. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and, and not only that, but the 10 rockets were precision guided based on the best possible intelligence intended to destroy enemy positions that were attacking you or enemy fighters. And the, the thousand or 10,000, whatever it was, 10,000, I think, um, at that time of the conflict, um, were indiscriminate. They were fired mm. at the civilian population from within civilian populations mm. being used as human shields. So one side committing war crimes, the other side legitimately defending itself. And if the Prime Minister does not stand up for one side, for, for the right against the wrong, then what kind of leadership is that giving to young people or old people in this country? Mm. Well, mentioning young people, I'm going to take this on a deep dive from that. I think trying to reach them when they're at college and university is too late um, I think we should do it, and I, and, and I admire you for going in. And we have to, you know, have to go on this mission. But personally, I mean, if there's any parents listening right now, I would encourage you. You need to start educating your children from childhood about Israel um, that they are not anti-Semitic, that anti-Semitism can't seep into them. It's what I did as a parent. I mean, my children, all of them, I mean, they haven't known a day when they haven't understood the value of standing by Israel. Um, so, you know, I would like to see, which is probably another dream that's a long way off, of seeing this in schools, seeing it in primary schools, in um, that, that this anti-Semitic... Um, attitude, although it's more than that, than that, is tackled right from childhood. I couldn't agree more, and I think it's extremely important. Um, and I do sometimes also speak at high schools, uh, although I have to say mainly Jewish high schools rather than non-Jewish high schools about Israel. Sometimes I've, I've spoken at, at non-Jewish schools about Israel. Um, but and, and people often say, if you're talking to a Jewish audience like a you know, Jewish school, um, or, or a Jewish group at university or something like that, um, that you're preaching to the choir. Well, actually, it's not really the case because, as I mentioned, quite a few Jewish people have either don't want anything to do with Israel or have turned against it. And, and those, even those who are strong, staunch supporters of Israel, uh, whether they're children or they're adults, they do need, they do need an antidote to the venom that gets churned out by the BBC, by Sky News, by Channel 4 News, by so many other media outlets. They, you know, because you hear that from all sides and you read it in the press um, and you get a lot of it on social media. You can't help but begin to wonder, well, is it true? Am I, are they right and am I wrong? You can't help it. You're not human if you don't do that. And therefore, preaching to the choir is in, extremely important in keeping the choir singing in tune um mm. but there there is I, I agree with you about about um trying to um educate from an early age and it is parents that are uh, are going to be the ones that do it because teachers are very unlikely to do it i think maybe i would say most of the teachers in this country wouldn't share our views on israel probably the opposite mm. um and 
there, there is a group actually in the United States of America, which I've had some association with, which is called, I call it Club Z. But over there, across the water, they call it Club Z for some yeah. inexplicable <laughs> reason. But it's a, it is a, a fantastic organization um, founded by a, uh, a Russian Jewish woman um, in, in California. And, uh, and, and, and they, they hold regular and frequent sessions for high school children, educating them on the reality of Israel. And they're, they're, in, my, in my view, they're, they're relatively small at the moment. They've got branches across the country, but they are relatively small. And they need to be a lot bigger. And in my view, they, they do a fantastic job. And I've met many of the alumni uh, and current students who are, who are working with them. And they, they, you know, it's, it's, the effect they've had is absolutely fantastic. Um, and, and it's not, I don't think there are, I don't know of any, or significant groups over here in in the UK that attempts to do the same thing, but I think we def we desperately need that. Certainly, from my experience of talking to high school students as well as teachers. Well, as as we begin to wind up, can I just ask um, a question that maybe many who are listening are asking? I hope they're asking, what can the average person do? <laughs> well, I think the average person um, depend, depends on their station or their status or their position in life and in society. I think, as I mentioned already, students um, at university can stick up for their Jewish fellows at the university and defend them and help protect them and make up their numbers. They don't really have to do a huge amount. I'm not talking about going out, roll your sleeves up and get stuck into a fight because it's not really so much about that. It's more about um, propaganda and media. And, ideological and, war. Right. It's political warfare. And they, they, so they need to take part in that. And all, all it really ne means is not signing petitions or voting against Jewish um, uh, groups or pro-Israeli groups. And actually, if you can, go and join them, take part, learn something from them. You don't necessarily agree with it, but do it. So I think that's that. That is, I think it's so important for 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 solidarity for Jewish students from Christians or or people without religion, um, and, and Muslims, of course. In some cases, there are Muslims who are involved in support for Israel. A surprising number, actually. Um, I've encountered many myself, and of course, just one going off the point slightly. One thing I would say is that those people who are trying to attack Israel in our country um, or in other Western countries, whether it's in the media, whether it is at universities, whether it's in human rights organizations, wherever it is, BDS, the people that are really damaging are the Palestinian Arabs. They're the ones that are suffering most because of this. Mm. Um, and you know they, they, they these these people who allege allege that they are pro Palestinian. If they were generally pro Palestinian, they wouldn't be attacking Israel. They would be you know Arabs living in Israel are are the freest Arabs in the Middle East. They mm. are the only ones really that get the vote that's meaningful. They're the only ones that have equal rights with everybody. They're the only ones that live in a, 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 pro, a proper democracy. They are the freest Arabs in the Middle East. Um, but the Arabs that live in Judea and Samaria and the Arabs that live in Gaza uh, are certainly not free and they're oppressed and they're disadvantaged and they're impoverished and their lives are made in misery by their leadership. So it's Hamas and it's the leadership of the Palestinian Authority that these people should be working against rather than against Israel. Sorry, that's a slight diversion, but I think, no, I think it's so important because, because my, I, I, I sympathise with Israelis who suffer from this conflict, but I think I have, if anything, even greater sympathy for Palestinians because I know that they suffer most, but not because mm. of the actions of Israel, because of the actions of their leadership and the supporters of the anti-Israel movement around the world. Mm. And I think the other thing I would say is that um, the uh, the... You know, ordinary people outside universities should 
they should try and, and inside universities, but they should follow this. Uh, if they if they do want to do something, they should follow the action and the follow events in Israel closely, study the history, because the history is extremely important, study it, follow the events. Unfortunately, it could become a, a full, full-time full career, but it doesn't have to. It can be, it can. It does take a lot of time if you want to get, if you want to really understand it. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, write to your MP. Once you've researched and once you understand the truth, write to your MP and complain uh, if either, you know, other MPs in that, that party or, Parliament is doing something that uh, that you know doesn't seem right in relation to Israel. Um, if you if you have uh, any influence in the media, try and get your influence into the media. I think these are the things that uh, will make the most difference. Uh, and don't be sucked in, don't be drawn in, don't believe the anti-Israel bile that is churned out because it is. I, I mean, I almost never criticise Israel. It's not because Israel. Is, a, is perfect. It's not. It's like our country. It's far from perfect. But but there is such a strong body of voices against Israel. It doesn't need another one to join in. So unless you feel particularly strongly about something that Israel is doing and you know that what, you're, what they're doing is wrong, which it might be in some cases, then don't just join the chorus and the... the, the uh, you know, the, 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 um, the, the, the herds that are following... Uh, the the anti-Israel stuff just just you know just go the other way. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to mention the that we have made a documentary which may be useful to people, which goes through many of these topics hop- uh, topics through the eyes of young people from around the world. Um, what is it? Quest number four truth dot org, which which is a useful tool some people may have. Um, for themselves or certainly t- for young people to see. And you're right that um, more often than not, it's the Palestinians that are going to be damaged by mm. the BDS movement, things like that. And I know there was one business, I can't remember what the business was, but they had a branch in the Palestinian territory employing Palestinians. And because of the pressure internationally from the BDS movement, they ended up shutting that branch down. And so it ended up being the Palestinian people that were the victims of this uprising with the BDS movement, and they're the ones that lost all their jobs. Uh, And so as an example of what you're talking about, very often it actually ends up being them that gets hurt and not not Israel anyway. Mm. Right. Um, Richard, thank you so much. We really appreciate you having taken the time. I know you're crazy busy, uh, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Richard, so much. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. I apologise to your listeners for having to listen to me bang on, but uh, <laughs> oh, no. I, 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 um, I think it's a really important subject, and I also commend both of you for the extremely valuable work you're doing, and thank you very much for having me on your show. Oh, we invited you on to bang on, so there's no reason to apologise. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. If it inspired you, please rate us and subscribe on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify or another podcast platform.